Thank you. Um, so this is a joint work with my postdoc, uh, Ming Chang Li, and actually most of the ideas came from him. Um, the motivation is uh, in disk arrays uh, is subject to uh, different types of failures. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, a disk array will, subject, it will be subject to device failure where you lose all your data in a disk, or it may be the setter area, or some people call this the latent setter errors, where you will lose the data in one particular setter. So there are a lot of measurement studies showing that uh, these type of failures are very common in real life. So the left figure shows the annual disk a uh, failure rate collected from the Google data center. So it finds that actually the disk failure rates could reach up to 10%, which is a lot if you consider that uh, in a large scale system, there are a lot of disks. Now the uh, middle figure talks about the set of failures. Um, basically what it shows is the set of failure rate is much higher than the disk failure rate. So the set of failures are actually more common uh, to be found in real life. And the right figure basically shows that the set of failure patterns actually could come in a burst. It's not very, uh, it's not very frequent, uh, but it's still possible. So the question is, how do we protect against these device failures and also the set of failures? And the common approach is to apply erasure coding. Uh, here we consider the NK systematic MDS codes. Basically, it can be summarized as uh, what well, we, we try to encode k data symbols into n minus k additional symbols, which we call the parities. And then uh, we have n symbols, which we call the stripe, and distribute these uh, n symbols across the disk. And any k of n symbols can reconstruct the original uh, k data symbols. Or in, put in other words, as long as you have k symbols, then you can reconstruct all the n symbols. Uh, you can think of this symbol as one byte, uh, but typically when we apply to this arrays, it will be mapped to this setters. The size could be like 512 bytes or maybe some kilobytes. Uh, what we do is we encode uh, each symbol repeatedly. So you can think of actually the symbol could be directly mapped to setters. And Ray is just one specific implementation of erasure coding. For example, Ray 5, you can tolerate one disk failure. And Ray 6, you can tolerate two disk failures. The question is, given that uh, the disk array would be subject to uh, disk failures and set of failures, so how do we apply erasure coding in this scenario? So let's consider a worst case failure scenario as an example. Let's say uh, there could be at most m equals to one entirely parity, uh, entire fa uh, entirely failed device. And in addition to that, there could be m prime equals to two partially failed devices, where you don't lose all your data in those devices, but you, you lose some of your data. And in those two parity failed devices, there could be uh, one or three set of failures at most. Uh, here we consider a stripe, okay? So, uh, so within a stripe, uh, there could be one and three set of failures in these M prime partially failed devices. So the question is, how do we design the erasure code that can tolerate such a mixed failure scenario? Now let's consider a uh, traditional approach which is used by RAID. Um, actually what it does is, it doesn't consider whether it's uh, device failure or set of failures. It just considers that the whole device fails, okay? So what it does is, uh, it would just simply allocate three parity devices to tolerate both the entirely failed device and the partially failed devices. Which is actually the motivation when people uh, design RAID 6 because uh, uh, they find that in this array, not only you have one failed device, but in addition to that, you can have some latent set error. So that's why they come up with RAID 6 to tolerate two uh, device failures. But that actually is an overkill, because right now you use two parity devices to tolerate two partially failed devices. Maybe at any point of time, you just lose one setter at most, but you use the whole parity device to protect against such one setter failure. Now, if we consider that right now we store a lot of data, that is, that is quite a lot of uh, storage redundancy, or that's, that's a huge overhead. And the observation is that in RAID or many traditional erasure coding, actually, they just assume the device level uh, for tolerance. They, they don't consider the mixed failure scenario. What, what do you mean with partially? You mean sector? What is partially failed So a device has some, uh, some lost data, some, some set of failures. Well, in entirely failed device, you lose all your data in the disk. 
So like this could have. What's the difference from the coding perspective? <coughs> how does this make a difference? Uh, we will come to that maybe later. I think it's sector failure. I think it's has it on the on the top one. So it means sector failure. Yeah. Okay, but the okay, figure. that's why I'm asking. Does it mean yeah. sector failure? Yeah. yeah. So another approach is uh, we allocate uh, some parity setters per device. And this is the approach taken by uh, this is what they call the IDR approach. Um, because right now in our scenario, uh, the, the, the worst case is there would be three uh, set of failures. So what it does is it just assumes the worst case and in each device uh, you allocate three parity setters. Uh, and also you have one uh, parity device to tolerate the entirely filled disk. And in this case you can see that actually it's very expensive because right now you add parity setters per data device. And the observation here is that these parity setters only take care of its own device, but, uh, but among, uh, across these uh, devices, they are independent. But, but these are three out of how many setters? Uh, it depends on the number of rows that you, you consider. Right now, we consider 16. Yeah. So actually, how big are the sectors generally? Uh, typically, it's 512 bytes. Uh, but it could be like one kilobyte and four kilobyte, but it's on the KB scale. Yeah. So, uh, so the 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 recent work uh, came up with a code called the SD code, and what they want to do is to design a code that can tolerate simultaneously the M entirely failed devices, and in addition to that, S failed setters per stripe in those partially failed devices. So. Here, uh, this is the stripe, uh, how, how the stripe looks like. So you have M parity devices, and in addition to that, you have S parity setters. So what that means is, let's say you have the device fails. And in addition to that, any S uh, setter failures happen in this stripe. So they can still be protected by these S parity setters. And the current, uh, currently, the construction will be limited to S less than or equal to 3. I'll, I'll explain a little bit why, why is the case in a moment. So the question is, now go back to our scena uh, worst case scenario. What, what should we do if we want to? Yep. I just have a question. Sure. I'm just thinking about this now. So I, relating to Ashish's uh, uh, talk, uh, if I just put, put all these green things in a big line, mm -hmm. one after the other, it seems you want to correct one group of four mm -hmm. and any extra three. That is stronger than what you're doing, right? That would work for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, but there's, a, there's a huge overhead. I mean, the, the huge overhead would involve collecting, uh, uh, correcting any set of six. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, one, one def so it, it stack all the green boxes in one big line. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing you can say is any set of six uh, I can't tolerate. Okay, that then you can do with it. It's only one that's huge over here. But he does better than that, right? Because he doesn't do any set of six. He does any any one, four consecutive ones plus three arbitrary ones. But but we see the difference because yeah, this is even more restrictive because yeah, but yeah. this is not any yeah. set of four. This is this is yeah, they are in a block and the block starts at a right. Specific. The block starts at specific, whereas his block can be arbitrary. Yeah. Okay. So so just to clarify, are you doing like a, no, you're, not doing this, you're doing like let's say no streaming, three right? random locations plus one full call. Right. That's, that is your right. 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 So is this related to the Roth one double work on correct colors and random errors and full colors? Uh, I don't know about that. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe let's give him Sorry. a chance. <laughs> so, um, let's get to this. <laughs> so the question is, uh, let's say right now I have at most four uh, set of failures. Um, so in this case, we will need to dedicate uh, four parity setters. We call that the global because you can protect any set of failures within the strike. Now, turns out that such a construction is unavailable. Now, okay, th here come two issues here. Uh, here come two issues. The first issue is why it's not available. Maybe you just simply take all these green sectors as the data symbols and use MDS code uh, to construct the remaining red symbols as the parity symbols. Then in this case, it's an MDS code. You can, you can uh, tolerate any S number of uh, set of failures. 
it works. But the thing is, um, the overhead will be very huge because right now, whenever you, for example, you do the encoding, you need to collect all these green symbols to encode all the parity symbols. And when you do the decoding, let's say you lose one, uh, one setter here, you need to collect the other setters or the parity setters so as to reconstruct this uh, parity setter. That, from the implementation perspective, the overhead will be huge. It depends on the number of rows that you allocate. So when you say overhead, you don't necessarily mean um, coding rate, you mean computational complexity. Computational, yeah, exactly. So here, uh, we put a requirement which is, very, which is very similar to rate, is this parity device will be just generated uh, by the data symbols of the same row. So for example, this one, I want to just generate this parity using the uh, same row of data symbols to generate this one. And, and for the other one, it also generated by the data symbols of the same row. And only for these parity setters that will be generated by other data setters within the stripe. So that's why, uh, because of this constraint, um, the uh, S decode is only limited to S equal uh, less than or equal to three. And if, when, when they come up with the code, it's very different from the traditional approach of you, you have an encoding matrix, you multiply this matrix with the vector of data symbol and generate the parity symbols. And what they do is they need to come up with some algebraic equations and try to exhaustively search for the solution space, which is uh, very different from uh, the traditional coding approach. So, so that's why uh, they cannot find this for S uh, greater than three. And that, that, uh, that's the uh, limitation. So what we want to do is, can we come up with another code that uh, uh, take this uh, constraint away? Can I ask a question about field size? What about field size? What are your constraints on the field size? Uh, we didn't consider that. It just uh, because later on we just built on existing MDS code. So um, I think they consider the field size uh, one byte, uh, two bytes, and four bytes in SD code. But here we just consider one byte as as the uh, as the same. So. Uh, that's why we came up with the uh, stack code, and we want to construct general and space efficient code. And by general, what that means is uh, it has no limitation on the size of the storage array, and and the number of tolerable device failures, which is M, and the number of tolerable set of failures. Um, and also by space efficiency, what that means is uh, we want to just use the parity setters to tolerate set of failures, just like. Or SD code instead of using the whole parity device. And because uh, we call this stack code, and later we'll see the reason. So uh, we consider the failure scenario is uh, just like the rate. If you have M this failures, you just use the uh, rate reconstruction, uh, reconstruction approach uh, to just uh, rebuild the M this devices. And for the fault tolerance, we consider the worst case where M this failures and also the coverage of set of failures, which we will define the coverage in, in, in a moment. Now, uh, one thing is, um, this code, uh, we, we didn't consider the repair performance. Um, so what that means is, if you have uh, one failed device, you still read the amount of original data. Uh, so we, we didn't consider the, the repair performance in our work, but uh, in this work, but, but later on in future work, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, in distributed storage system, which I, I, I would cover at the end of, of the talk. So, uh, so the uh, idea is uh, we want to make it general, so we need to uh, get some trade-off, or make, make some trade-off. So what is the trade-off here? So in SD code, you can tolerate any number of set of failures within a stripe. Now here, instead of uh, tolerating any number of set, uh, uh, any number of set of failures, we now define a pattern of how the set of failures occur instead of how many set of failures occur. So, uh, if you are able to define this coverage, what we call the uh, set of failure coverage factor, then basically everything will be very straightforward, and you can simply build the code using the existing MDS code. And we find uh, we, we, we use this approach to come up with two encoding methods, upstairs and downstairs encoding, and they are uh, complementary to each other, which I will show you how they work. So let's talk about uh, what 
what we mean by the set of failure coverage factor. So basically, uh, it's defined by a factor of m prime elements. What it does is it tries to bound the number of devices that have set of failures in addition to the device failure. So right now, let's say you, you want to tolerate m device failures. Okay, now remaining, uh, we have m minus m devices. Now within this m minus m, uh, you can pick a number which is m prime, which could contain the set of failures. So, uh, so we assume that the design operators can come up with this parameter m prime, okay? And within these partially failed devices, you bound the number of set of failures per device, which is EL. And the sum of this EL will be S, S is equal to the number of set of failures uh, that you can tolerate within a strike. And the rationale is if the set of failures could come in burst, so what you can do is you can define a small M prime and some reasonable size EL for the burst. So let me give you an example back to our previous uh, uh, scenario where I want to have, uh, tolerate this uh, two partially failed devices with uh, one set of failures and three set of failures in the other device. So what we do is we can de design a f uh, factor which is one three. What it means is any two devices uh, in the, uh, besides these entirely failed devices could have set of failures where one device could have at most three set of failures, and another one could have at most one set of failures. When you put this factor, you have the protection. So basically, this is how it works. And you can design this E uh, to, uh, to take care of some special cases. For example, if E equals to one, that will be very similar, uh, that will be equivalent to the PMDS code and S decodes with S equal to one. Um, if E equals to R, basically uh, you assume that one partially failed device, but all these uh, uh, setters considered to be failed, actually it's just equivalent to the entirely partially failed device. Sorry, entirely failed device. So in this case, it would be just equivalent to this n, n minus m minus one codes. And uh, if E, you, you put all the epsilons where there would be n minus m uh, elements that will be equivalent to the IDL codes uh, with uh, epsilon parity symbols. So basically, uh, you can come up with different E and you, you, you can construct the code uh, accordingly. Now, uh, we don't advocate any particular E, so that will be the future work. What should be the right E uh, when we construct the code? Now, suppose that we know this E. So the question is, uh, how do we generate these parity symbols? Now, uh, what we want to do is we want to have a stripe where we have one uh, parity device, and also uh, we reserve some space to store this uh, one free global parity setters. And uh, to generate this uh, global parity setters and parity device, what we do is we use two MDS code, C row and C column. Uh, we don't put uh, any restriction on this MDS code, but here we, we consider the uh, cauchy Solomon codes. So what we do is we go through two phases. The first phase is uh, we do it in the row uh, direction where you have the data symbols in each row and you generate the parities where you will generate the parity devices and the additional uh, intermediate parities. We don't store these intermediate parities which will be served as the input to the second phase to generate the global parity setters. Now you can easily see that actually uh, these global parity setters can protect the set of failure pattern that we defined earlier. For example, let's say you have uh, one set of fail. So in this case, uh, this will be, uh, can, you can consider it as a erasure, but you have this parity symbol to protect this. So in this case, you can use this to uh, reconstruct the uh, uh, loss, uh, lost setter. So in this case, uh, that, that will work. Now, the question is, where do we store these global parity centers? In general, you have to find somewhere to store these global parity centers. So what we do is, we want to move that inside the stripe, and this is what we want to do. Now, given the data symbols as the input, you can generate the output, which is the global parity centers. What we do is, 
with set these parities such as as zeros and try to uh, inversely find out uh, what should be the uh, values of these global parity setters. So given the data uh, symbols and also the output would be equal to zero, I want to generate all these parity setters as well as this parity device. So in this way, I can reconstruct uh, the inside global parity setters. So how do we do that? And the idea is we augment the stripe, which we call the uh, canonical stripe, such that we augment the row by encode this with uh, the C column, okay? So to form the augmented rows. And you have some uh, empty space, which we call the virtual parities. And I want to generate such virtual parities so as to reconstruct all these uh, parity sectors that I actually store. And because of this linear property, actually each augmented row is actually a code word of the C row. Okay, so this one actually is a code word of the C row. Now, how do we generate this uh, red parity symbols? And let's take a one approach, which is the upstairs approach. Um, uh, you can also see that the parity layout is, is, is like a stair, so that's why we call it a stair code. And what we do is uh, we try to follow the upstairs direction, try to generate all the uh, possible symbols uh, given the uh, uh, available uh, symbols. And you can also generalize this as the decoding approach. Uh, think of this as you, you lose some symbols and you follow the same way to reconstruct the lost symbol. So let's take a look at how these uh, stair codes work. So what we do is we first pick the C row and C column. In this example, that will be 10, 7, and 7, 4. So any seven symbols, you can get all the 10 symbols. And for the column direction, any four symbols, you can get all the seven symbols. Now, we start with the leftmost column. Now, because right now we have four symbols, oh, sorry. So right now, because we have four symbols, so you can generate all, all the other three uh, in, in step one. Step two, you can generate the other three, step three, step four, and step five. Now, you find that right now, in this particular row, you have uh, the five symbols that you just generated, as well as the zeros that you assumed earlier. So right now, I can generate the uh, symbols for step six. And step seven, because right now in this column, I have four, three green symbols, which, is of, which are available. And also this one, you just generate this. So that's why I have uh, the other uh, parities. And you do it alternately between the row and column direction, and you can generate all these uh, uh, parity symbols. And one thing is, uh, the parity computation is based on the previous computer parities, and we find that it will improve the encoding performance. Uh, the downstairs direction work in a very similar way. Uh, I won't go into the detail, but you can. The main idea is, uh, you do it alternately to generate all these symbols. And these two encoding methods would give you the same result. Okay, you will generate the same set of parity symbols, but the performance are different. Performance in the sense that uh, the encoding, the number of uh, and uh, number of multiplications that you need to do. And we do a lot of analysis in the paper, and the intuition is for large M prime, you should choose the upstairs encoding for the downstairs encoding. Uh, for small M prime, you should choose the downstairs encoding. And, and the analysis is, uh, in, uh, is in the paper. So we do some evaluation. Uh, the first evaluation is we look at the uh, space saving, and the x-axis is different R, uh, the number of rows uh, per stripe and we take from 0 to 32, and the y-axis is the number of devices uh, that you store. Basically, if the rows is, uh, is large, um, basically you just use a small number of parity setters instead of the whole device, so it will approach M prime uh, if, if R increases. So, so that's intuitive. Uh, that one is compared to the traditional rate. Um, this is the encoding speed. Uh, we implement the code and try to measure the encoding performance, what we find is basically it's very fast. It's on the order of 1,000 megabytes per second, which is much faster than the I.O. speed. So we believe that the encoding won't be the bottleneck. And compare with SD code, because we reuse the parity, so that's why the performance is, is good. And the penalty here is the update cost, because right now, when you update one data symbol, you also need to update the 
not only the, the parity symbol of the same row, but also the global parities. And when you update the global parities, you also affect the parity symbols of the same row. So that's why the update cost will be higher than traditional uh, erasure code that have the same fault tolerance. And that's what we see here. But we think it should be still OK if we consider system with rare updates, such as backups, or those with full stripe rights, such as SSD. And actually, uh, we didn't consider the uh, repair in the uh, earlier work, but we find that actually we can map the stair code in the distributed storage system. So the idea is, uh, right now, for each row, you can think of this as a rack. And each setter, you can map this to a node. And what you can do is, if you uh, want to, re let's say, if any node fail, you can use the parity of the same rack to reconstruct the loss uh, lost uh, data. And in this case, you don't do and you, you don't you won't tr trigger any cross red transfer, which is very important because in data center cross red bandwidth is very limited. And the main idea is uh, you also want to not only use this parity to improve the repair performance, but you can also use this parity to tolerate the burst of the failures within the rack. And we find that you can improve both the repair per, uh, performance and also the storage efficiency, which is something uh, we consider. But there are, there's a lot of engineering work when, when we play in the Hadoop file system, you need to uh, change the scheduling, which is something uh, another issue. So uh, to conclude, uh, basically, um, we propose their code and have two uh, complementary enco encoding methods. And the uh, implementation is open source, so you can try it out and, and, and extend it. Um, thank you. I appreciate your questions. So I may have misunderstood something, but back to Lara's question, it really looks very much like a work by Gabidulin and Roth from the 90s, where they were working the grade systems as well, and they came up with these Gabidulin codes. And uh, they are using also MDS codes in Ronnie's construction, at least, which are the code words are put on the diagonals. It looks a little bit like the either downstairs or upstairs construction. Mm -hmm. And as Lara pointed out, there were recent work where you can basically uh, figure out how to trade off uh, disk uh, versus <laughs> sector failure. And you decide to call the disk failure if you have a certain threshold of errors. If you exceed a certain number of errors, you call it a disk failure, and if you have a smaller number of errors, you just concatenate, let's say, a subspace code and an MDS code. And I'm not sure if you have seen that work. And if, oh, okay, because it seems related. I may be off, but it seems very, very related. What was the name of the code? So the early work, uh, just Google Gabidulin codes. You will see. I, I can talk to you a little bit later. So, are there any <coughs> distance metrics that you are trying to achieve with these constructions, like for the? kind of failures you are looking at. Maybe just the Hamming distance may not be the right metric. Subspace, subspace uh, we, we, we didn't consider that. Just we assume the fail device and also the fail center. OK, maybe a last quick question and then we move on. So, so, uh, so maybe I, I didn't follow some part. But so, so you have this class of codes, and you showed it an example of this 1.3 uh, model. So you have a device, and then you have this 1.3 burst. So how general is the construction at all? I mean, so why can't you do SD codes? I mean, why or can you do it? Can can you so in your framework can you get an instance of SD codes or some output? Um, for for S equal to one, we can get an instance of SD code. SD code is like a lit failure, but let's say many failures. Yeah, so you lose a device and then you have I don't know five additional failures. Uh, in that case, SD codes doesn't work. Uh, well, no, it's, it's a matter of alphabet. So there are constructions that, that I mean, it's just that the alphabet would be large. Right. In fact, you can get the MR property, uh, which is stronger than SD property. And there are constructions that you can essentially, the field would be somewhat large, but you, there, there are instances of codes that do that. The whole question is how big the field size is. Well, at least, at, least at, at this point, we, we don't know uh, what's the case for S equal to uh, larger than uh, 3. Yeah. OK, so uh, thanks a lot. Thanks.